Now, let us try to focus on what we need to do here. So, we're turning our attention now uh, to molecules, and with molecules comes cellular structure. And so the cellular structure we're concerned about first are, is probably or arguably the most important cellular structure because that's the membrane. Without a membrane, a cell doesn't exist. Without a membrane, organelles don't exist. Okay? So the membrane, it's important to understand something about the structure at the molecular level of the membrane. And also important to understand the function of the membrane. Okay? So that's what we're going to be focusing on in today's lecture, and I'm sure that's going to carry over into tomorrow's lecture as well. When we think of membranes, um, there's something I want to plant in your head, and that's the lipid bilayer. You've probably had this in cellular molecular biology, if you've had that class already, uh, or basic biology class. The membrane is a, uh, a bilayer that has on the outside of its layers, notice I said layers, uh, molecule, the portions of a molecule that are very polar. And on the inside of its layers, it has portions of molecules that are very nonpolar. Well, fatty acids fit this bill very well, although we don't see fatty acids in the free form in membranes for the most part. We see them bound to other things. So it's important that we start thinking then about fatty acids because we're going to need to understand them to understand the membranes themselves. Okay, so I've shown on the screen some of the most uh, common fatty acids that are found in cells. And when we look at fatty acids, we notice uh, a couple of things. First of all, fatty acids have a long nonpolar tail. And nonpolar, of course, carbon, hydrogen, carbon, hydrogen, carbon, hydrogen, etc. They have a polar end, so they are amphiphilic, okay? And they differ from each other in a couple ways. One way in which they differ is how long that tail is, that is the number of carbons that they contain. Another way in which they differ is in the presence or absence of double bonds. So fatty acids that do not contain double bonds are known as saturated fatty acids because they all have saturated carbon-carbon uh, bonds. And fatty acids that have at least one double bond are known as unsaturated fatty acids. Fatty acids that have at least two double bonds are known as polyunsaturated fatty acids. Okay. Now notice I said polyunsaturated fatty acids. We hear about polyunsaturated fats, and not surprisingly, polyunsaturated fats are molecules that contain multiple or contain fatty acids that themselves are polyunsaturated. The unsaturation that occurs uh, biologically is very strongly biased in the direction of having cis double bonds, cis not trans. And cis double bonds actually cause molecules to have a bend in them as a result of it. Now that bending has some important properties uh, for us to consider as they relate to the properties of the membranes. We hear about trans fats, and trans fats are fats that contain fatty acids with trans double bonds. Those are rare biologically. Most of the trans fats that arise arise as a result of chemical treatment of food. Okay? So trans fats are largely a phenomenon of the chemical treatment of food, and we'll talk about that. Start with the saturated fatty acids. You can see that the most common saturated fatty acids are between 12 and 20 carbons long. And if you look at the melting point of these fatty acids, you see that they vary according to the length of the number of carbons that they have. The shorter they are, the lower the melting point. The longer they are, the higher the melting point. Now, I'm not going to ask you, certainly, to write the formulas, because I think that's kind of silly. But I do think that there's a couple of fatty acids here that you should know the names of and how long they are. One is this one right here. Palmitic acid is the most common fatty acid that's in your body. Okay? Palmitic acid has a total of 16 carbons. Okay? And another common fatty acid that you have in your body is called stearic acid, which has 18. Now, both of these are saturated fatty acids, meaning they have no double bonds. 
Now, I want you to remember the lengths or the melting points of these guys. The shortest guy here, okay, 12 carbons, has a melting point of 44 degrees centigrade, meaning that that sucker is going to be a solid if it were present alone in your body at your body's temperature, which is only 37. Okay? In the next table, we see the effect of unsaturation on fatty acids. Okay? If I start with Palmetto Lake, which is the shortest one that we commonly see in our body of 16 carbons, notice it has a melting point of 0 0.5 degrees centigrade. The presence of one single double bond changes that melting point significantly. And we can see that when we get up here to something like, like these increase in size, so if we go from 16 to 18 with one double bond, we see we go from minus 0.5 to 16. So again, we see an increase in the melting temperature as the number of carbons increases. But look what happens when we increase the number of double bonds. Now we go from 18 carbons with one double bond to 16, 18 carbons with two double bonds to minus 5. So again, the more unsaturation we have, the lower the melting point. The more saturation we have, the higher the melting point. The shorter the fatty acid, the lower the melting point. And the longer the fatty acid, the higher the melting point. Now, there's only really uh, these three fatty acids, actually these four fatty acids here, are pretty important for various purposes. And I do think you should know the names of them. I'm not going to ask you to know all the other features about them. Okay? Now, there's a reason I expect you to know the names of these. Oleic acid is a fatty acid that we can make in our bodies. When we talk about fatty acid synthesis later, we'll see why that's the case. Okay? But we can make this one in our bodies. We cannot make these last three. These guys have got to be in our diet. Right? And because they have to be in our diet, they're what we call essential fatty acids. They're essential that they be in our diet. Okay. This guy right here is important because it's involved in the synthesis of an important group of molecules called prostaglandins, which I probably won't be able to talk about today, but I will talk about next time. Now, another thing about these unsaturated fatty acids is the number of double bonds that they have. So this number right here tells you how many double bonds they have. This guy has three, this guy has four, um, etc. And that number of double bonds is um, really critical to their melting temperature. Now, we take fatty acids and we put them into molecules to make membranes. And I'm going to show you those molecules in a little bit. But the properties of those membranes arise directly from the properties of the fatty acids within them. Okay? It's a very important point. The properties of the membranes come directly from the property of the fatty acids within them. I'll give you an example. Okay? You have um, one of the things that our membranes have. We have some unsaturated fatty acids in our membranes because it's important that membranes be fluid. We want membranes to be fluid. Which means we don't want them solid. We don't want them unmelted. We want them melted, as it were, right? Well, I've already told you that the very shortest one on there for the saturated fatty acids had a melting temperature of 44. Okay? So it means that if I'm going to make a, a membrane, I had sure better mix that with some unsaturated fatty acids if I want it to be a fluid membrane. Those of you who are nutrition majors have heard of omega-3 fatty acids, and probably others have heard of omega-3 fatty acids as well. Omega-3 fatty acids are associated with some very good health benefits. Okay? And those very good health benefits arise uh, from their unsaturation. We always are taught that polyunsaturated fats are good for us and so forth. Okay? A really good example is fish, fish oil. Right? Fish live in the ocean. The ocean is cold. The environment of the ocean is colder than the environment that we're living in out here as a whole. And moreover, our body regulates temperature at 37 degrees centigrade. If I'm a fish swimming around in the ocean, it's important that I be able to keep my membranes fluid at a much lower temperature. Fish, therefore, have membranes that contain fatty acids that are more unsaturated. In fact, they contain omega-3 fatty acids 
like this guy right here. And that's why fish oil is a very common source of omega-3 fatty acids. So they can remain with their membranes and their other components fluid at the temperature that they're found in the ocean. Very important consideration. Okay. Well, some of the molecules that we put fatty acids into have a couple of categories. One's the glycerophospholipids that I'm going to show you here, and also the sphingolipids that I'll talk about in just a minute. They both contain fatty acids. Let's start by talking about the glycerophospholipids. So I'm a very big believer in listening to names because names tell us important things, whether it's the name of an enzyme that tells us what the enzyme does, or it's the name of a molecule that tells us something about the structure of it. Now, the category of molecules I'm talking about here are called glycerophospholipids. You can hear them called phosphoglycerides. It's a variety of names that they have. I like to call them glycerophospholipids because it says exactly what they contain. Glycero referring to the molecule glycerol. Okay? The molecule glycerol. It's a three-carbon molecule. And the glycerol part of this molecule is here, here, here. There's the three-carbon backbone that comes from glycerol. It's a phospholipid, meaning it contains phosphate. And there's the phosphate on the last carbon. It's a lipid because it contains these fatty acids. That means I need to tell you what is a lipid. A lipid is a molecule that has at least a portion of it very nonpolar. That's what a lipid is. A lipid is a molecule that contains at least a portion of it very nonpolar. Fatty acids are therefore lipids. Glycerophospholipids are lipids. Sphingolipids are lipids. Waxes are lipids. Cholesterol, as we will see, is a lipid. Vitamin A is a lipid. A lot of things are lipids because at least part of them is very nonpolar. Okay? Well, the glycerophospholipid, as I said, has a glycero, glycerol backbone. It has a phosphate on the last carbon. And it has two fatty acids, one designated by this R2 and one designated by this R1. Glycerophospholipids are some primary components of our membrane lipid bilayer. Now, I told you that we wanted to have that membrane be fluid. And I told you that we need to mix some unsaturated fatty acids with the saturated fatty acids. And that's exactly what happens in molecules like this. Most commonly, the first fatty acid up here is saturated. And most commonly, the second fatty acid here is unsaturated. So the combination of these two work together to affect the fluidity, that is the temperature at which the membrane remains fluid, of a given lipid membrane. Okay. Here's a modified form of this guy right here. Phosphatidic acid is a very simple glycerophospholipid. More commonly, when we see membranes, we will see them with specific groups. So here's a stearic acid at position 1. Here is a linoleic acid at position 2. And down here, we see the phosphate has been attached to something else. And when that happens, we create something we call a phosphatide, okay? or in this case, a phosphatidyl ester. Okay? So phosphatides have something attached to the phosphate. Phosphatide is a phosphatidyl ester. Same thing. Same thing. Here are some examples of some phosphatidyl esters. And you'll notice that in these figures, sometimes we see the fatty acid going off to the left. Sometimes we see it going off to the right. And for our purposes, it doesn't really matter. Okay. All right. Now, here's something called phosphatidyl choline. Let's look at the components of it. First of all, here's the glycerol backbone. Here's a fatty acid. Here's a fatty acid. Here's our phosphate. And here's something attached to it. The something attached to it is known as choline. So when we think of this molecule, this portion all the way up to the, that choline is the phosphatidyl part. 
Choline is linked to it. So we therefore call it phosphatidylcholine. Okay? It doesn't have to be choline. Choline is a very common one. We also see the attachment of, a of an ethanolamine at this point, in which case we would create something known as a phosphatidyl. Imagine putting this whole group linked right here, a phosphatidyl ethanolamine. We could attach a serine, and we would have a phosphatidyl serine. There's the serine portion right there. We could attach a, glycer uh, uh, a glycerol. We'd have phosphatidyl glycerol. And we have a variety of different compounds that we could add. Some of them get a little complicated. Okay. You're not going to draw structures here. But I do think that you should know that a phosphatidyl compound contains the following things. It contains a glycerol backbone. It contains two fatty acids. And it contains a phosphate. And then whatever gets attached to that phosphate makes the phosphatidyl compound have its name, phosphatidylserine, phosphatidylethanolamine, phosphatidylcholine, etc. Phosphatidyl Kevin Ahern. Please don't attach me to a phosphatidyl compound. All right. So those are the phosphatidyl compounds. And as I said, they are very important constituents of the lipid bilayer. Another important constituent of the lipid bilayer is a, arises from what we call sphingolipids. And these are shown down below. I'm going to say a little bit more about them in just a second. But before I talk about those, I want to talk about another class of lipids called waxes. Waxes are not really found in lipid bilayers, but they are very important lipids. We have wax in our ears as a protective mechanism. Wax is protective because, as you know, when you wax your car, it repels water. Okay? And if you look at the structure of this, it's not really surprising. Look at that long carbon tail. There's 24 carbons, 25 if you count that end one right there, that's just carbon and hydrogen. It's a very long nonpolar tail. It's linked as an ester, that's what this bond is right here, to a compound that has 29 carbons, a total of 30 out at this end. So this is a very long molecule, very, very nonpolar. And nonpolar molecules, of course, are not going to interact <coughs> excuse me, with water. Here's another uh, wax, OK, and so forth. OK. So those are lipids. Waxes are lipids. The other lipids that I said are very important for uh, the lipid bilayer are a class of molecules known as the sphingolipids. So the sphingolipids. Um, look on the surface like they're very different from the glycerophospholipids. Okay? But in fact, they have some very common features. Remember the glycerophospholipid had that three carbon backbone that came from glycerol. If we look at the backbone of a sphingolipid, okay, we see one, uh, I'm sorry, we see one, two, three carbons essentially. Right? This carbon is attached to a long nonpolar chain, kind of like a fatty acid. This guy is not at the moment attached to anything, but this guy is also attached to a fatty acid. So at some level, this thing looks kind of like a glycerolipid of some sort. We don't have a phosphate on here. Notice that. Some sphingolipids have phosphate. And here's an example, sphingomyelin. Okay. Now, again, I'm not going to ask you to draw the structures of these, so I don't want you to get worried about structure. Okay? But I will, t I will distinguish the sphingolipids from the glycerophospholipids by one important thing. Okay? Sphingolipids contain a nitrogen. Glycerophospholipids do not. So we see a nitrogen there. We also see a double bond between that sort of backbone structure. Okay? Now, sphingomyelin is a very important component of the membrane sheath around your nerve cells. Nerve diseases arise, in many cases, from deficiencies or problems arising from sphingomyelin. Sphingomyelin is a rare sphingolipid that contains phosphate. Most of them do not contain phosphate. Okay? Most sphingolipids do not contain phosphate. 
Sphingolipids can get fairly complicated. And they get complicated because of what's attached to that bottom carbon. That bottom carbon you saw in the case of sphingomyelin had a phosphate and some other stuff attached to it. But I said phosphate wasn't common. Much more commonly, that bottom carbon becomes attached to a sugar molecule. That's what this is. This is a sugar molecule. Okay. If I take a sphingolipid and I put a single sugar molecule on it, I make something called a cerebroside. A cerebroside, this portion of the molecule right here. You might say, well, what's a gluco part? Well, the gluco part is this happens to be a glucose. If I attached a different sugar, I would call it a different name. But the common name for this whole structure is a cerebroside. So I'm gonna, the definition of a cerebroside then is a sphingolipid that contains a single sugar. A single sugar. Now I'm going to show you a structure in a second that's not a single sugar, and you're going to be very happy I don't make you draw the structure on an exam. Let's take a look at a more complicated sphingolipid known as a gangliocide. Whoa, okay. Where in the world is the three carbon backbone for this guy? Well, it turns out it's over here. One, two, three. The bottom carbon here is attached to this monstrosity out here, okay? If I have a sphingolipid that has a complicated sugar attached to it, it's called a gangliocide. Now those names tell you a little bit about where we find these guys a lot. Cerebroside found in the brain tissue because of the cerebellum, right? Gangliocide found in nerve tissue, commonly found in the brain tissue as well. So these sphingolipids we more commonly see in, in brain and nervous tissue. Sphingomyelin, I said, was the sheath of nerve cells. Okay. And you're not going to need to worry about the individual names of gangliosides or any of that. The last class of molecules that I'll talk about here that we commonly find in the membranes are the steroids. Specifically, cholesterol. Okay? This is the structure of cholesterol. No, you're not going to draw the structure of cholesterol, but I think you should recognize that steroids, of which cholesterol is one, commonly have this ring, 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 ring. Six, 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 five. Okay? When you see something that looks like that, irrespective of all the other stuff attached to it. You see this basic ring structure. I want you to think steroid slash cholesterol. In our bodies, cholesterol is the precursor of the steroid hormones. It's also the precursor of something we call bile acids that are important for digestion. And cholesterol is also important because it's a precursor of vitamin D. We make vitamin D from cholesterol. Now, we tend to think about cholesterol, and, and, and I don't like using this terminology, but other people do, so I will uh, echo that. And as we think of cholesterol as bad, right? We have bad cholesterol. Well, we associate cholesterol with bad because we have been taught that high cholesterol levels okay, are linked to heart attacks, atherosclerosis, and stroke. And in fact, there is a relationship between levels of cholesterol found in the blood, certain types of cholesterol, and those very nasty health effects. So it always comes as a surprise to students when I tell them that cholesterol is important for your body. It's very important for your body. Your body is making it for a reason. We'll see that cholesterol in your body is there, partly because your body makes it, partly because your body stores it from your food, and partly because uh, your body um, well, it absorbs it from your food, and partly because your body stores it. All right? So all three of those things give rise to cholesterol. Cholesterol turns out to be found in the lipid bilayer. It turns out to be found in the lipid bilayer. Now I'm going to say something in a minute about why it's important in the lipid bilayer. All right? But I'll give you an idea of its importance right now. Okay? If we take brain tissue, 
and we completely dry it, we discover that the dry weight of brain tissue is 14% cholesterol. 14% of the dry weight of our brain is cholesterol. It says that cholesterol is a very significant component of our membranes. Okay? Our brain is just one example. So cholesterol has some very important things. Cholesterol is one of the most interesting molecules of your body. And it's a molecule of our body about which we know surprisingly little. There have been something like seven Nobel Prizes that have been awarded for people who've made findings about cholesterol. And there's still a lot about cholesterol that we don't know. Okay? It's the molecule I probably get the most questions about in this class. And I'll, I'll be coming up and saying more about cholesterol as we go through the class. But cholesterol is a very interesting molecule in that sense. So I want to impress on you it's important and it's a component of membranes. At the very bottom of this figure, we can see three different steroid hormones, okay? testosterone, estradiol, progesterone, main maintenance of pregnancy right there, female uh, sex hormone, male sex hormone. And you can see they have good similarity to the backbone of cholesterol. No surprise, they're actually made from cholesterol. Well, I've been talking about a lipid bilayer. Let's talk. Let's take a look at a lipid bilayer. This is what a lipid bilayer looks like. Why do we call it a bilayer? Well, it has two layers. We can think of it as a top layer and a bottom layer. And like I said, the outer portions are very hydrophilic. They like to associate with water. So we can think of them as having heads, kind of like this. In the case of the glycerophospholipid, the head would consist of that phosphate end, right? And the tail would be those two fatty acids sticking off of it, kind of like here. When we think about a lipid bilayer, we think about the way it arranges, the way it is comprising a membrane. We can think of the top portion, for example, as being the outside part of the cell, and the bottom portion as being the inside part of the cell. We look at how these arrange themselves, and we begin to see, oh, that starts to look like a cell. I've done a cross section through one of them so I can see the inner part, and I can see the outer part out here. Now, the amazing thing about these molecules is that they will spontaneously form these structures. We don't need to have special instructions for our cells to organize a lipid bilayer. They do it by the chemical um, composition that they have. Just like I said we could have glycerophospholipids here, we can also have sphingolipids. The, the head portion there would co be consistent of the sugars, or in the case of sphingomyelin, that phosphate end. And those tails hanging off could be those long nonpolar portions that I described to you earlier. OK. All right, so I mentioned earlier the effects of unsaturation. What does unsaturation do? It causes bends, and bends actually have an energetic component to them. An energetic component. Imagine I have a saturated fatty acid. And I have not only one unsaturated fatty acid, but I have billions of them all lined up over here on the left. We can imagine that they would probably, if they weren't in a bilayer, and they could arrange themselves in a bilayer as well, but I'm just thinking about them in one layer for the moment. We can imagine that they would all line themselves up, just kind of going all the way over here as they are. And they would have a very regular and repeating structure because there's no interruptions. When we see regular repeating structures, okay, that's how we form solids. Water starts to freeze because it starts to organize into crystals. Okay. How do those crystals of water form? They form as we start taking energy away from them. And they start to be constrained in the movements that they can make. The same thing happens with fatty acids. If I start taking, if I start cooling them down, then they start having less movement and they start becoming a solid. 
Well, it turns out that if I have a very regular structure, it's much more easy for it to stop moving. It's much more easy for it to get organized. It's much more easy to freeze. Whereas if I have unsaturated things, those bends cause chaos. I have to take more energy away from them before they will start to become regular. And that's why the unsaturated fatty acids have a lower melting temperature, because I have to take more energy away to get them to get organized. That makes sense? OK. So unsaturation is very important, then, as we think about melting temperature. Here's a better depiction of the same thing. Here's now a glycerophospholipid. There's that polar head. And here's a saturated one. Here's one that has an unsaturated bond. And we could imagine that they might organize themselves in a lipid bilayer. This is going to be more chaotic and harder to organize because of these bends than if all these guys were simply saturated, all lined up. That's why fish oil melts at a lower temperature than does uh, the lipids in our membranes. Okay. Our membranes are, are more saturated than those found in fish, okay. because fish are in that colder environment. And they want to keep those membranes as fluid as they can. Now, I mentioned cholesterol. And this is a depiction of cholesterol in one segment of the lipid bilayer. Cholesterol's got a single, single portion of it that interacts with water. It's this hydroxyl group right here. And you can see it's oriented itself up here with the heads, basically. This is the portion that's going to interact with water in blue. And these portions are going to be nonpolar inside of here. Okay. Tomorrow, I'm going to tell you the effect cholesterol has on the lipid bilayer's melting temperature. Okay. It's a little complicated, so I'm not going to go into it here. I am, however, going to finish with a song, as I always do. And I want to take you back to that. Today's song is based on yesterday's lecture. And it is a very easy one to sing. So I want to hear everybody sing this one. It's not that one. It's actually this one. Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. All serine proteases work almost identically. Using amino acids, at triads catalytically. First they bind peptide substrates, holding on to them so tight, changing their structure when they get them in the S1 site. Then there are electron shifts at the active site. Serine gives up its proton as the reaction goes on. Next, the alkoxide ion, being so electron rich, grabs peptides carbonyl group, breaks its bond without a hitch. So one piece is bound to it, the other gets set free. Water has to act next to let the final fragment loose. Then it's back where it started, waiting for a peptide chain that it can bind itself to. Go and start all over again. All right, guys, see you tomorrow. <laughs>